the modern world, we access information and services 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. There's almost nothing we can't have at the push of a button. But it wasn't always so. The miracle of internet commerce began with the new millennium and brought with it all the devices and online services we now take for granted. Compared to life before it, our modern age is truly a lifestyle for the gods. But how did we acquire such superpowers? In this series, we're going to take a look at how modern information infrastructure got so big so fast. It's a tale of discovery, not of nature, but of society and technology developing in tandem. And the ride is not poised to stop anytime soon, but we also need to make changes for a sustainable future. The internet is now one of the worst polluters on the planet, and the way we build and use it conceals inefficiencies that would horrify the Victorian engineers of the steam age. All this places us on a quest for a better understanding of information and its technologies. One that we sorely need to find the next generation of technologies for all. Everything is changing and we're either going to devolve and go backwards into sort of a, a less complex uh, state of being uh, as a you know, human society or we're going we're gonna to graduate into a new level, higher level of functioning. We're doing this now at a, I think, a global scale uh, where in the past the learning would be slower, like we wouldn't get all the IDs out in Europe. So that, that's going to be a new challenge to almost like filter all the product IDs, like the backlog is, is now not only one person, but there are like 20,000 customers who have uh, new IDs. I think we're going to see dramatic changes in the entire stack as we refactor everything around three core principles. And I think one will, of course, look at it after the fact and say, well, of course it's that way. What other way could it have been? You know, it's like truth is, is hiding in, in plain sight. Um, and, and it's just that we keep trying to hammer on our, you know, the, you know, centric, you know our Earth-centric Earth -centric view of the, the universe because it seems so obvious to us until it's explained to us in another obvious way. On a clear day, if we look down from a great height, we see patterns, the likes of which no soul could have witnessed a century ago. Rivers, fields, towns and cities. Structures marking human society and ownership. Natural, but fashioned through the agency of human action. Our human influence is a relatively new phenomenon in the history of the planet, but a powerful one. On this scale, the world feels unfamiliar. The curving spine of what first appears to be a fossilized creature is actually the backbone of a village whose inner workings are invisible from this height. A winding river is the legacy of competition between flowing water and the resistance of land to its passage. The world is a patchwork of overlapping processes localized in space and time. To understand our planet, our technology, indeed ourselves, we need to look at it on many different scales, from the patterns of climate and weather to the conversations between its inhabitants, all the way down to the motion of electrons in atoms. The story of human machine technologies is in many ways a tale of daring about how we confront those scale boundaries, 
how decisions on the smallest scale can have an impact on the lives of millions, and vice versa. The human experiment has given us an opportunity to study technical and social change on timescales never before witnessed by humankind. And all of this means we now need new principles and models to understand the science behind it. We're still discovering that science. So the social networking effect is, again, people working together. I think the value that people see uh, from a goal is that they, they are looking for people with the same ideas, much like in the company where you find people around, you know, things that get you passionate or uh, help, helping other people. And it, it seems to be very rewarding also for them to help other people uh, learn but they also learn themselves and they also get uh, newer insights uh, in the things they are doing. The distinction for me is the distinction between defined process and empirical process. Some of the professors that influenced Scrum uh, discussed the difference between tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge, right? So when we have explicit knowledge that's reducible to a video or documentation, you know, that's a pretty good sign that we've got a well-defined process. It can be taught through watching a video, through reading. Uh, we're, we're ta that's explicit knowledge. The tacit knowledge, you can't get out of a book, usually because it's, it's complex work, uh, and there, you need an empirical process for that. So you need to be near the, the craftsmen and, and looking over their shoulder and, and learning from them um, how, to, how to do it. You can't get it out of a book. So it's more like riding a bicycle than, than building a bicycle, right? Uh, manufacturing, uh, the idea is that we look to um, make processes efficient. We give people the ability to, to stop the line. We have a focus on quality. Um, and we build the quality in from the beginning and that this slows us down in the beginning and then speeds us up, right? Like once we, once we have a focus on quality, a lot of other things take care of themselves. Agile comes out of software development. Software development, you know, software engineering as a, as a discipline and science is uh, woefully, continues to be woefully behind other engineering disciplines like mechanical, electrical, civil. And um, projects are notoriously late. Uh, and the main reason is because we've, we've approached it as a, metaphor about manufacturing when actually uh, a more appropriate metaphor might be uh, one about cultivation or growing something. Uh, most software projects when they first start are, are we're guessing what the, what the folks actually want and, and when we'll be able to deliver what they want, right? So there's a, it's a the wild ass guess. Usually the guess is a plus or minus uh, two standard deviations. Uh, so we're, it's, it's a total, total random guess. Uh, Agile gives us a way of uh, managing that, uh, controlling the chaos by getting some direct experience, narrowing the what we call the cone of uncertainty so we can make uh, more accurate predictions, more reliable predictions, uh, and deliver what folks want on time, or at least within a reasonable time. And so the way I define it is it's the capacity of an engineering group or any group that's building a complex product to identify and rapidly respond to change. I think it just opens up more of the human potential because we're just doing that uh, so that we can get back to what we're good at is dealing with the hard problem. Things that we would be doing in the past that were hard, like get a new compute with five CPUs and memory, 
that has definitely become easier. As these things come easier, we're able to build more complex architectures on top of that and do more complex solutions. I send a message in Europe that, you know, within a couple of milliseconds, it's happening in the US. Uh, because of the infrastructure that been there, we can now focus on the middleware layer. We keep pushing then the boundaries of what we can do, and that we still keep having complex things uh, that need to be done. Indeed, one of the challenges we have in the uh, document space, right, it's an area that's rich with, uh, with uh, uh, innovation, is this idea of collaboration and collaboration across space and time and, um, and, and across different connectivity domains. What you really see is that the notion of a document changes. And what it is, is a document is no longer a, a container with a set of sentences. A document is a process with a set of changes. And then when you read something, you can't read a set of changes. So what we'll do is we'll take those set of changes and we run them and render it into something that you can then see. Everything that happens is a process, no matter whether it involves human, animal, plant, or machine. Matter and energy are just generic ways of describing them. Complex processes are not easy to unpick, but the science of simple step-by-step -step processes is well understood. British mathematician Alan Turing described the simplest processes as sequences of change that form the basis for computation and recipes. Turing's American counterpart, Claude Shannon, showed that such symbols are not only the building blocks of process, but are in fact elements of information that are the basis of all interaction. Patterns formed within processes take the form of languages and fall into a hierarchy of types named after the American linguist Noam Chomsky. He proved that increasingly complex patterns must be associated with increasingly sophisticated processes. The mundane processes we see around us that are described by Newton's laws of physics appear simple to us, but only because we are unable to see the underlying details on a small scale. From a great height, anything can appear simple. The trick is to know when there's more going on. We can illustrate the basics of processes using just a pack of cards. Imagine a process to make something, say a cake. A simple case of putting something together which is the sum of its parts. We can list the steps using playing cards as names for them. One or ace of diamonds means flour, and two of diamonds means sugar. Many industrial processes use post-it notes like this to represent process stages. In Shannon's language, what this does is to compress the information of a long description to a single number or label that represents the step. Every time we want to add sugar, we can just say, okay, do a two of diamonds. The diamonds aren't even relevant at this stage, so saying number two would be enough. In processes, names are often more important than numbers. The qualitative meaning, rather than the quantitative amount, describes the roles. We can go on to add new types of cards and even repeat the same card to make outcomes that contain different mixtures of diamonds, clubs, hearts and spades. Notice how each step expands the amount of space taken up to remember the process. The unfolding trajectory forms a production line 
or an ordered queue of symbols leading to an outcome. Like clients at a checkout. Each type of change can be given a name or be represented by a symbol in a mathematical sense, like a unique type of card. In other words, processes are basically sentences or stories formed by making strings of symbols, laying one after another. Of course, cards don't do anything in the sense that machines do. They're just labels that stand for something else. But we can imagine each card corresponding to a bunch of internal changes, like adding flour, or adding a panel to a car, adding food to a plate, or adding a number to a computation. I think the, the idea is to prescribe the bare minimum that's uh, in, in terms of the boundary definitions that are needed to get the group or the individuals in the group moving in a certain direction. This apparently innocuous idea conceals a lot of surprisingly deep and subtle questions, which take on a vital meaning when dealing with the massive information infrastructures of cloud computing or distributed global manufacturing. What then is an outcome? Is it information or material? Something physical or something virtual? Is it just a pattern? Is it something we can eat or just something we can read about? In fact, it doesn't matter because both are just forms of information used by different processes. There's no meaningful difference between physical and virtual except in the way different kinds of process experience them. This is an extraordinary revelation. Processes fill space and their memories are space. They also create time because each change step acts like the tick of a clock. Each process is a clock, counting within the memory that available space offers. Without new steps, nothing changes and the clock stops. Time stops for the process. Others outside the process might disagree though. This is where the notion of time and space get quite complicated. Any observer outside of one process is itself a process, one that watches by sampling the cards step by step. Unless its clock is ticking, it can't sample information from the other. While you're sleeping, you don't experience any time passing. If every process ticked in perfect synchrony, what we call simultaneously, or at the same time, everyone would experience change at exactly the same rate. This was Newton's view of the universe, but we now know that's wrong. Einstein showed that it was wrong in physics. And this simple model shows that it's wrong for all independent processes of any kind, like computers and global delivery chains. This has enormous significance for the internet and the world of information on a global scale. Time seems to run at different rates when processes race one another by their own internal clocks. What others see is decisive for how they interact. Processes may offer information in one manner, but receive signals in another. Each time two processes exchange information, it's a joint effort between a plus and a minus. Nothing ever happens at the command of a single process. This is the essence of promise theory, which tells us how the relativity of processes changes at different scales. Our idea of space isn't just a single timeline either. With more types to discriminate, it can have different dimensions or different ways of remembering changes. By keeping some of that memory private or inside a closed region, we can count changes internally so that outside observers can't see those changes. We usually call those degrees of freedom internal states. To exterior observers who can't see them directly, Interior changes may happen in no time at all that they can measure. 
Observers may try to follow a process and may or may not agree on the passage of time or the number of steps that took place. If the observer sleeps, it will see a lot of symbols change as if they were a single change. If it samples too often, it will see change happening more slowly, according to its own clock. We see that space and time, or memory and its change, are not independent concepts. They can't exist without each other, because without space you'd have nothing to remember with, and without time you would forever be frozen. All this makes life more complicated when some processes take longer than others. The bigger the scale of processes like services, i.e. the more interior states to change, the slower they may appear to external observers like clients. This is highly confusing, even to the programmers and system designers who build our information systems, and it means we sometimes get things wrong. With attention focused on speed and scale, the common standard in many organizations is to enforce militarized project management by command from the top down. But projects need both experimentation and a reliable infrastructure to end up in the hands of users. Perhaps we focus on process because processes are the stories we tell as part of human culture. But infrastructure is the hidden enabler. Just as a story can't be written down without a medium, a process can't exist without an enabling infrastructure. Whether emergent or designed, we take infrastructure for granted at our peril. Water, electricity, buildings, roads, communication. The smart use of space and time. The ubiquity of those dependencies is the very reason for suppressing them. We prefer to ignore the repetitive and focus on what we perceive as novel. But where does infrastructure end and process begin? The stories we tell often involve a separation of concerns, parts we like to emphasize and parts we prefer to suppress as detail. The idea that a certain parts of a process can specialize to carry out one function well is a key device in storytelling. In business we might speak of the back-end office work, in computing we might speak of subroutines or library functions. In society we rely on utilities, essential services and buildings. Curiously, Sciences like fundamental physics don't use the notion of functional roles. Those are considered human issues, and classically, what we call the laws of physics have been treated as a given. A divine rule of law imposed, or at least provided, from without. But in biology, cells, plants and animals are considered to have functions within networks and ecosystems. Perhaps predator or prey, pollinator or cleanser. The processes they partake in become a handy infrastructure for other agents to exploit in a separation of roles that bring continuity. Classically, physics has neglected the active roles of system agents, choosing to view things as passive game pieces directed by forces without further explanation. But that kind of thinking is being turned on its head, not only by a century of discovery in fundamental science, but specifically by the lessons of scale that we're now learning in the globalized world of the internet age. When you go to cloud computing, your f the physics of the cloud force you to do the right things. The physics of the desktop are such that you can, and 
by demonstration have done lots and lots and lots of bad practices. Okay, so in the desktop, we used to have a three year clock, right? We would plan for a year, develop for a year, test for a year, and then ship it. Very, very slow clock. Now, reality changed, and we were delivering a, a product that was appropriate for the reality there. In the cloud, you are constantly shipping, constantly, constantly, constantly. Not every day, but like really every couple minutes, you're shipping a new version. You limit the scope of it, uh, but within you know the course of a week, everybody in the world gets multiple versions of, of the software. So the major boundary types um, are time, task, and territory. So if we pay attention to these boundaries, we'll find that um, some of them are rather vague. Uh, so for example, even in, in the Scrum framework, which is, you know, really we could look at it as a boundary management system, Mark, actually. It's a 15 minute time boxed thing. So the task is well defined and bounded. The, the time is also well defined and bounded. In fact, it says in the Scrum guide, you know, um, that Scrum Master keep, teaches the team to keep the time box. You know. So the task and the timer boundaries are very clear. However, the territory boundary is, is entirely vague. I, I, I keep coming back to this distinction, um, which I find very illuminating, the more you think about it, between the God's eye view and the local observer view. And by the way, when I mean God, I don't mean that in an in a, in a, in a, in a either sense, a negative or a positive sense, uh, from a religious perspective. I kind of use it to make fun of programmers <laughs> who think they're God and they want to reach across the systems, you know, the distributed systems, and pretend they know what's going on at distance because it's that illusion that is the curse. And I call it the curse of the God's eye view. And it's a curse because it's so easy to slide into that way of thinking. I know I do it myself sometimes. But the reality is everything we measure is local. Everything we measure is, um, is at a particular point. Um, and from the view of the self, um, and, and the self is, of course, the only distinguished um, observer point you can ever have. There's no way we can model this still in our head. Like, oh yeah, if I do A, then it's B is going to happen uh, and, and so on. Uh, and it's also, un it feels uncontrollable because there's so many actors playing in the system or agents uh, that, that work, have to work together to uh, do something. I always find it amazing that the internet works, right? Re recording this over the internet, <laughs> insanely, if you think about all the things that could go wrong, and still somehow we, we, we manage. For a single thread of process, one agent can enact the changes at a fixed location. Each step from its symbolic algorithm passes like a frame in a movie reel. Alternatively, successive frames can be passed from agent to agent like a relay race, creating a trajectory through space like an assembly line. Several processes side by side or in parallel always live in their own separate and private worlds like swim lanes, as long as their threads never need to interact. But sometimes we need to compare processes. So let's call for um, say Sambat and the Pink Dragons. Would you please um, go to the presentation stage and get ready for the um, outfit uh, performance? Uh, I repeat, say Sambat and the Pink Dragons. Would you please go to the safe as soon as possible? Thank you. On the Chinese calendar, each year competitors race one another at the Dragon Boat Festival. It's a repeating event that marks the change of seasons on the lunar calendar. Competitors paddle their boats in different lanes, coordinated by a starting signal. Their paddling motions forming a private clock for each team. They move towards coordinated finishing lines where the judges compare all the processes to arrive at a winning outcome. 
parallel processes racing one another. Then finally compared to another process that watches and judges them. Many clocks compared by one. Each judge calibrates the outcome essentially by looking, because the signal is, for all intents and purposes, instantaneously visible. That might seem obvious, but what if, at the end of the race, the competitors didn't signal to a single judge by crossing a line or raising a flag, but rather had to mail a letter to the judge from different postboxes? A much slower mode of communication with a non-negligible process time compared to the race itself. Now the judging of the race would become a new leg we didn't realize we had to account for, and what the judge receives in the end would depend as much, or perhaps even more, on the postal delivery as it does on the boats. All this might seem absurdly obvious on one level, the problem is, no one ever teaches us to think about the speed of signaling versus the speed of a desired process. We're too used to living in a world with signals traveling at light speed to have much experience in understanding, let alone designing a system that's bigger. But this is the challenge we face in the age of the internet. One of the challenges we have in the uh, document space, right, it's an area that's rich with, uh, with uh, uh, innovation, is this idea of collaboration and collaboration across space and time and, um, and, and across different connectivity domains. So it's one thing to say, we went from a world that says, okay, I have a document and when I'm done, I hand it to you and then you make changes and then you hand it back to me and then I accept those changes. Now we've got a world where, okay, well, I've got a document and we're both editing it at the same time, okay? So, okay, you can get your head around how you'd make that work. But now imagine the case where we're editing the same document at the same time, but we're not connected to the, not connected which is to say, I'm disconnected and you're disconnected and we're both editing the document. Like, how do you merge those changes? And it turns out it's, it's very much like a, a distributed source code control system. And so that's the approach uh, we're taking to this problem. What if the goal were not to win, but rather for all the boats to arrive in perfect alignment? That's what happens when a musical ensemble plays. I think the, the idea is to prescribe the bare minimum that's uh, in, in terms of the boundary definitions that are needed to get the group or the individuals in the group moving in a certain direction. Yeah. Um, and that's what we've got with, with Scrum, uh, but even there there's some vagueness. So I get, what I'm really getting at is the boundary definition in design is not as easy as it looks. Um, and it brings in the concept of elegance, right? So if you have too many uh, 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 prescribed constraints, you'll, you'll kill the self-organization, the self-management. For some people who never take a pattern for granted, it will never work here. <laughs> Uh, then there's people who say, well, this looks like a nice pattern, uh, let's repeat it. Uh, but they lack the context uh, or they don't think about the context where the pattern emerged from. And then there's people uh, just, they hate pattern. <laughs> like they do anything to break the pattern uh, <laughs> because it feels like that they're stuck in something. And orchestral performance is, as the name suggests, orchestrated precisely to deliver a highly specific outcome, not just at the end of the race between the instruments, but at each moment to be judged by the audience. By sharing a singular score composed of many parallel instrument voices 
The efforts of each player, although entirely individual, are guided by a common time base, a single clock, signaled by the conductor and accepted voluntarily by each agent. The players reach an equilibrium in their counting of time, entirely by voluntary subordination to a process on a larger scale. Researchers have found that the heartbeats of the players even begin to synchronize while playing, just as the purring of nocturnal crickets also reaches a coordinated state. Of course, the players can also play their parts without any coordination at all. To an observer listening to such a chaotic, unsynchronized rendition, one moment is not easily distinguishable from another. Disorder has no distinguishing marks on a collective scale, so there are no patterns to perceive, and no obvious way to count time. Multiplication of state does not increase the state space. Uh, what it does is you have a, a, a single reference copy. If you think about Shannon's information theory, right? <clears throat> you want to send just the information uh, required to produce a state change on the other system. Yeah. All I have to do is to send state changes. And so that's what happens. I send you know, a change is made to the state here. I return and I take that state change and I send it everywhere else. Fine. And say a, a system goes down for maintenance. When it comes back up, we say, okay, now you do not have the same state as everything else. So I can't send you just the most recent state change. I have to find out what state you have and then send you all the state changes from when you last were in sync. And so I know, you know, what, what is your state? It's a transaction ID. I take a look at the current transaction ID and I say, oh, I know exactly what state you were in. I know exactly how to get you in the state you need to be. So I send those transactions. Now we know we're at the same state and now I can be, again, more efficient. I can send you just the most recent state chain. For the behavior to be smarter, it needs to be aligned with just the right clock. To form a collaborative process, an ensemble or a society, agents need to achieve an ordered state in which they align their behaviors, giving up their autonomy in order to act as a unit, to act as a super agent. The first signal allowing them to synchronize their pitch or the process of vibration inside the instruments comes from the lead violin, or concertmaster, whose appointed role is to calibrate the orchestra on the timescale of vibrations. A simple picture of the conductor's calibration can be found in software used for making coordinated performances like music and film, where multiple contributions come together. The idea of swim lanes is used here too. A single line sweeps over all the parts to mark out a single clock, which all the parts align to. Potential randomness congeals around a concerted meta-process by the promise of coordination. Many clocks, many observations. To each observer, the sounds from other players and the waves of the baton signal the passing of a singular exterior time, and the audience samples the result. Two promises, plus and minus, entangled and working together. The simple idea that each agent has an individual perspective is called space-time relativity. 
That's a grand name for a simple observation. Each individual inevitably has their own experience of what's going on. It's true to a small extent in a concert hall. Sight and sound are different in each seat. But it's far more apparent to clients of the internet and global delivery chains, where large-scale distances amplify differences in agents' experiences. In computing technology, Computer scientist Leslie Lamport was one of the first to think about this problem for computer networks. He realized that when data take different paths across space and time, the outcome may not be perceived consistently by all agents. The need for consistency in outcomes first became apparent when building databases to store information sent as streams of symbols called transactions from different sources. A database acts like a judge in a race and decides the order in which records are processed and stored. If there's more than one database, more than one judge, they may not automatically reach a consensus on who wins the race. They may need to coordinate with each other. And that's not as easy as we may think. What you really see is that the notion of a document changes. And what it is, is a document is no longer a, a container with a set of sentences. A document is a process. And then when you read something, you can't read a set of changes. So what we'll do is we'll take those set of changes and we run them and render it into something that you can then see. But that is an abstraction. Underneath the covers are all the changes. And so it's much more, a document is now much more like a database uh, with transactions and journaling. And so that is the trick, is now I can have multiple journals and then I've got to merge them and then deal with the case where the, the merges conflict. Sometimes when errors occur, Databases have to undo and redo some of the transactions, or roll back the master clock that governs the database process. But if I want to now go from here to somewhere over there, now you got to unwind. <laughs> you got to unwind, often going back, you know, going up the the interaction tree, sometimes to the very start, to then navigate somewhere else. And so you spend all this time navigating paths. Time can run backwards locally, as long as a process doesn't depend strongly on what happens around it. It turns out that the nature of time on a small and localized scale is qualitatively different to the nature of time on a large scale which is what physicists are used to describing. This new way of dealing with documents is very isomorphic to GET, or Distributed Source Code Control Systems. And it brings about a whole new set of problems and a whole new set of possibilities. If you would draw the parallel that you know, one big data center and you bring the data center up and down instead of having, you know, bring up one computer up and down all the time, uh, if you do that in software and you change the software, the, the, the analogy would be, you know, instead of deploying software all the time, being able to change parts of it without having to change the, the whole. We could reason very focused on one thing in a microservice and uh, make sure that that was happening. But the, the cost shifted to consensus, like the whole uh, microservices have to be in consensus. How do we test this? But in modern technology, as in quantum theory, those large-scale ideas begin to unravel. The best definition that we, we have right now, despite all of our advances in mathematics and physics, the best definition of time that we have right now is Aristotle's. Time is change that we can count. Now, the modern definition of change is quantum information theory. And can we, you know, under what circumstances can we observe change? And so that takes us back to the Boltzmann argument, which says that um, if something 
if, if something changes and then it changes back, um, then it, it's indistinguishable from it having, never having changed in the first place and we can't distinguish it from an entropy perspective. And so um, this really does then dig down deep into, well, what is the notion of time that we have? Is it this edge of reality that's constantly unfolding? Or is it this, this block of embedded space that, that you know, Leslie Lamport has, has got in mind uh, for the way that he looks at Minkowski space. Um, and this is, the, this is part of the debate right now. And so an interesting question on my mind is how do we inform that debate with measurements, um, with, with new science? And, I, and that's the thing that I think we're on the precipice of doing. I think, I think the entire world will make its, its Copernican <laughs> revolution happen in the next five to ten years. I think it's, absolutely, it's pretty inevitable. Um, and so this is going to be taught differently in schools ten years from now than it is today. Never before have technologists needed to understand the physics of space and time so urgently. And never before have our ideas about that physics been challenged so openly by experience. In practice, the world is not separable into swim lanes. When we combine processes to create cooperative systems on a large scale, whether in society, technology or nature, many threads have to come together. And they form complex networks. Technology is here to serve mankind, right? It's here to solve the problems of society and in doing so earn a profit. But a lot of what we do is, you know, more focused in on making a profit, advancing some technology, and a lot of, uh, I think we've lost our way. Like, we are here to serve others. Our, it's not about our success, it is about how we make others successful. I think we're going to see dramatic changes in the entire stack as we refactor everything around three core principles. The first core principle will be energy per answer. And while the second is latency, latency. And then lastly, it's durability. And that's the durability and the fault tolerance of your data. When everything was small and fairly slow, we understood how things worked because we were always able to see and hear outcomes more or less immediately. We made simple machinery that brought us through the Industrial Revolution. But in computers or manufacturing, you put together a sequence of steps to make an algorithm, and sometimes it doesn't go according to plan. try to keep everyone busy, feeding new tasks into parallel lanes to maximize our utilization of the available agents. It's efficient, but it's harder to understand exactly where and when we are, and which part of which process is ongoing in the space and time around us. In Western thinking, we haven't yet fully embraced the reality of systems, where everything is collaborative and interactive. We think short-term and transactionally. How can I sell you a quick one-off cure? Pop a pill and hope for the best. And the results can be haphazard, even inconsistent. To get beyond this transactional thinking, we need to embrace the perspectives of scale, to be able to change views between short-term and long-term, local and global, high-level and low-level. And that leads us to networks.